Please turn with me together to 1 Peter chapter 2, and we will read the verses 11 to 17. Now, it was only about two months ago that we had an expository sermon uh, on that Sunday morning from this very same passage. Our text was the verses 13 through to 17, and I, for one, uh, was very, very blessed by the studies and the commentaries that I, I read. Uh, that was an expository sermon. Uh, this afternoon, we use the 1 Peter 2, the very same passage, as uh, one of the, the passages for a topical sermon. And uh, so, may the Lord add his blessings to what we will read. So, 1 Peter 2, verse 11 and 12 at first, and remember that verse 11 and 12 form an introduction to uh, quite a few sections. And so, verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men, yet do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. In other words, love your church families. Fear God. Honor the king. In those days, the king was the emperor. Thus far the reading from God's word. Will you also please turn with me to page 129 in the Creeds and Confessions booklet and in the right column, on the bottom, we will find paragraph 23.4. So page 129, the right-hand column, paragraph 4. The Westminster Assembly, after having studied God's word very thoroughly, wrote, It is the duty of people to pray for those in authority, to honor them, to pay them taxes or other revenue, to obey their lawful commands, and to be subject to their authority for the sake of conscience. Neither unbelief nor difference in religion makes void the just and legal authority of office holders, nor frees the people, the church authorities included, from their due obedience to them. Much less does the Pope have any power or jurisdiction over civil authorities in their domains or over any of their people nor can he deprive them of their domains or lives if he shall judge them to be heretics or on any other pretense whatever. Thus far, the Westminster Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have already had three sermons on what the Bible says about Christians and the civil governments. Yes, about the relationship between church and state. And as we went through the Bible message of this topic, we tested all along 
whether the Westminster's Article 23 is truly conveying the biblical message and is doing that faithfully. Well, here is then our fourth and final sermon on the topic of the church and state. We have three points. Here is the first one. The duties of the Christian subject. The duties of the Christian subject. My brother and sister, God's word tells us there is no authority except from God. And those who exist are established by God. That's Romans 13 verse 1. Yes, on some or other level, every authority comes from God. What's the logical result of that? Well, the result is that if God has given us the civil authorities, the state, as we have just heard, then we must learn to live under those authorities under those governments. You ask, but, but does God's word give us guidelines as to how we should live under the government? Yes, God's word does. Indeed, the Bible gives the Christian at least four duties to perform toward their governments. Here is the first one. Pray. God's word tells us to pray for our rulers. Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, First of all then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all human beings, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Sadly, some Christians, when they pray for their governments, only pray one prayer, that God would judge those rulers. However, that's not the way how we are to understand the words that we've just heard from 1 Timothy. Entreaties, prayers, petitions, and thanksgiving. Rather, we are to pray that God will bless our rulers with good health, healthy marriages, and, and healthy family relations, and that God will give them wisdom and integrity, and best of all, that God will work faith in Christ in their hearts. So, that's the Christian's first duty toward government. Pray for them. Here's our second duty toward our rulers. We are to respect, honor them. You see, our New Testament passage tells us to love not only the brotherhood of believers, our church and our churches, on the presbytery, the ladies' presbytery, on the synod, but to respect or honor all people, to fear God, and to honor the king. We've read it in verse 17. Well, some people despise authority. Even some churchgoers might view authority as a negative thing. But is it not true that there's something wrong if we view authority as, as negative? I mean, are not governments given to us to guide, to defend, and to restrain? And aren't they a blessing? So rather than rebelling against governments and authorities, should not the Christian desire the government's rule? respect it, and honor it? Well, that was the second duty the Christian has toward his or her government, to honor them. Here is our third duty 
towards our governors or rulers. We are to pay to them taxes and other revenue. Romans 13, verse 6 and 7, which we have read a, a, a few weeks ago, exhorts the Christian, this is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Now people might see the paying of tax as a frustration or an inconvenience. And today, just as in Bible times, tax money is not always well spent. That is true. Nevertheless, God's Word tells us tax has to be paid. We cannot argue that simply because certain government laws, like tax laws, are an inconvenience to us, we will not obey those laws. Look what Joseph and Mary did, the parents of our Lord Jesus, when the emperor's law caused them great inconvenience. Yes, when the emperor ordered that all citizens uh, have to, had to travel to their ancestral cities, so that he make a census to do what? A census in order to increase his taxes on the Jews. No, despite the inconvenience, as Mary was pregnant and the journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem arduous, Joseph and Mary obeyed. And so, one could say Joseph risked the life of his wife and of their promised child to obey the civil magistrate through which the scriptures then got fulfilled. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrata, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago from the days of eternity. So you and I might think Joseph and Mary would have been justified that they had a good reason to stay in Nazareth. But God had not commanded them to stay there. God does not command us to be happy and wealthy. If we don't like the income tax structure and think government is unjust, that is no excuse for us to disobey, even though it may inconvenience us and cause us discomfort. Well, so far regarding the Christian's duty toward the government, uh, as the, that's the third one, and it's paying taxes and revenue. Here's our, our fourth duty towards our rulers. We are to obey their lawful commands and be subject to their authority. The Apostle Paul tells Titus to remind his church members to be subject to rulers, to authorities, and to be obedient. And in Romans 13, Paul says it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of your conscience. That means Christians are to do what the governing authorities tell us to do. And not just because we fear punishment, but also because we recognize that God stands behind government. And, if, and we want to avoid doing that which would violate our consciences, consciences before God. God is watching. We are to obey government. You ask again, always? Yes, but only in things lawful. That means things that are lawful in the eyes of God. If government would ask of us to do things that go against God's word, then it's not that 
we may disobey. No, then we must disobey. And the Bible gives us an abundance of examples of believers who disobeyed the ungodly laws of their rulers. For example, remember how the Hebrew midwives disobeyed the Egyptian king when he ordered them to kill every baby boy born from the Hebrew mothers. They did not only just disobey him, but they even lied to him later on when he asked. Also remember how Daniel's three friends disobeyed King Nebuchadnezzar's order to worship his gods and the statue which he had built. And also remember how John and Peter did not obey the Sanhedrin's orders not to speak and teach in the name of Jesus. And so it's clear that, uh, well, let me say it this way. It is clear that our New Zealand society, as well as our government, has in the last decades moved further away from God and from the Christian values once upheld in this country. So perhaps it is fair to ask, Christian, what unlawful things might the New Zealand government in future ask of you and me to do? At the moment, freedom of religion and freedom of speech is still allowed by our government. So I don't think that our government could ban the preaching of the gospel. Yes, they might limit or ban the Bible in schools program, for example, arguing that that's one of many religions in the country. But will they really ban the gospel in the way communist and Islam countries have done and are doing? I don't expect that to happen, not soon anyway. Could it in future happen that our government will punish Christian pastors and marriage celebrants who refuse to marry gay couples? Yes, they could. But that would be a case in which the Christian must disobey government and the Christian should repeat the words of Peter and John. Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. What if government would in future make a law which says New Zealanders are forbidden to say or to proclaim or to preach that the act of practicing of a homosexual lifestyle is wrong? Well, also in such a case, the Christian and the Christian preacher will have to obey God, whose word places homosexual activity under the headings of shameful lusts and sexual impurity and unnatural. It also uses the word God has given them over to the depravity of their minds. Nevertheless, the Christian pastor will do so prayerfully and as winsomely as possible and on the right forum or, or platform and in the right environment. My brother and sister, when government commands the Christian to do things that go against God's word, then the Christian will say respectfully, no, no. To the government and obey God. However, ordinarily, the Christian will and must submit in loyalty and respect to government. In fact, verse 13 commands Christians to submit themselves to every authority instituted among men. And this includes the authoritative institution, which we may call parliament, as well as the authoritative person, which we may call policeman X, Y, or Z. Currently, the New Zealand government is asking all religious institutions, and that includes the Reformed Church of Wainui Umata, 
to fill out a questionnaire regarding historical cases of sexual abuse that happened under our care as far back as 1950. Just imagine what would happen if any Christian church would fill out this questionnaire in a dishonest manner. Not only would such Christians be crushing their consciences before God's all-seeing eye, but if government found out that they were dishonest in filling out that questionnaire, then what shame and, and disrepute such Christians would bring to the Lord and to the gospel. And, and that ties in with 1 Peter 2, verse 11 and 12, that introduction. You see, contrary to such disobedience and dishonesty, here again, what 1 Peter 2 verse 12 says, live such good lives among the pagans that they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Well, so far regarding point one, the duties of the Christian subject. Here is point two. What about obedience to unbelieving rulers. My brother and sister, these four duties that the Christian must perform toward government and of which we have just been reminded, do Christians have to perform these only to Christian leaders in government? No, the Bible is clear. Christians must pray, they must honor, they must pay taxes to, and they must obey even unbelieving leaders. You see, our New Testament passage, uh, in our New Testament passage, the Apostle Peter urges Christians to be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, by which he means the king or emperor as supreme, or governors who are sent by him to do his will. 1 Peter 2, verse 13 and 14. And so, may I remind you of, of this one striking thing, which I also reminded you of two months ago when we had that sermon on this passage. You see, the emperor whom Peter, in 1 Peter 2, verse 13, refers to, was in all likelihood none other than the rascal Nero. What's more, gauging by the last chapter in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 5, verse 13, at the time when Peter was writing this letter, Peter was in Rome. That is in the same city and, and under the nose of Emperor Nero. But as Peter was writing these words of Christian obedience to the emperor, guess what Peter's state was? Well, the earliest records indicate that Peter was there in Rome, not sitting in the sun and basking or somewhere on a rooftop or at a beach. No, he was in prison as a prisoner of this very evil emperor Nero. Yet inspired by the Holy Spirit, Peter writes, honor the emperor. That same emperor would one day take Peter's life, crucify Peter upside down, as the church tradition has it. See? See what our New Testament passage expects of Christians? It expects of them to be good citizens even in extreme situations. See how Peter's desire, actually how God's desire for Christians is that they will be good people, well-behaving citizens, even under unbelieving rulers. My brother and sister, did not our Lord Jesus himself do that? Remember how 30 years before Peter wrote 1 Peter, 
Christ submitted to an unbelieving governor in Jerusalem. Yes, to Pontius Pilate. Can you see why the Westminster Article 23.4 says, Neither unbelief nor difference in religion makes void the just and legal authority of office holders, nor frees the people, the church authorities included, from their due obedience to such unbelieving uh, authorities. Again, 1 Peter 2 verse 16 exhorts Christians, Christians, live as free men, but do not use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Live as servants of God. So what does this verse mean? Well, it means that Christians live under their human authorities as free people. I mean, ultimately, not as slaves or servants of the king or, or emperor, but as servants of God. After all, ultimately, these human authorities, be they ever so powerful, will have no final say over Christian souls. Indeed, even if the Christian gets killed by ungodly human authorities, like Peter was, yet because he or she is in Christ, the Christian, even if he's killed, is ultimately free. However, this ultimate freedom from human authorities, Christians are not to use this as an excuse to despise their human authorities and to rebel against them or to attack them. Yes, if Christians really understand the freedom they have in Christ, now that they have been made right with God, then they will actually let this freedom be seen in their respect and loyalty, yes, in their willing submission and honor to their human authorities. And you know what? We quoted that about two months ago, but it's so beautiful, I want to quote it again. Martin Luther understood this freedom yet submission very well. You see, Martin Luther lived under the authority of emperor and pope, an authority no less powerful than that of Emperor Nero. Yet no one said it better than Martin Luther. Here is how he said it in two short sentences. He says, a Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. My brother and sister, the New Zealand government allows for Christians, for you and me, a whole lot more freedom than what Peter's first readers had, or than Christians currently in China have. You see, you and I are allowed to speak against our government's abortion laws as long as we do it with respect of life and property. But being Christians, you and I should never do what some who claim to be Christians have done, particularly in the USA. They damaged property of abortion clinics, graffitied them, painted over them, and even hurt and killed medical staff who have performed abortions. Well, let us think by ourselves. How will such atrocious actions ever cause non-Christians to see the glory of God? Peter says, for the Lord's sake, submit to the authorities. Thus far, point two, what about obedience to unbelieving rulers? Now, here is the very last small 
point. It's small because it really is is out of date. And the heading is, are ministers of religion also subject to the civil government? In other words, is your pastor also subject to the government? After all that we've just heard in the sermon, what an unnecessary question. So why does the Westminster 23.4 then even mention this? My brother and sister, Westminster 23.4 brings this matter up because the popes, as many of us will know through our knowledge of church history, thought themselves to be above the civil government. That is why the Westminster Assembly, based upon the Bible, have said, much less does the Pope have any power or jurisdiction over the civil authorities in their domains or over any of their people, nor can he deprive them of their domains. In other words, the Pope and I don't have the authority to pull Jacinda Ardern out of her position. And indeed, right through the ages, the Roman Catholic Church has confused the two distinct roles of the church and the state. And sadly, it has brought the name of the Christian church in disrepute. And it undermined the authority which God had delegated to civil governments and not to the church. The Roman Catholic Church has failed to see that God has given us two domains, a physical and a spiritual domain. And to each one of these, God has delegated its own authority. Indeed, the church has its government and its office bearers, and the state has its government and rulers. And the state cannot rule the church in religious matters. Neither can the church rule the state in civil matters. Yes, the two can advise one another or seek advice from one another, but the one cannot do the work of the other. Thus also church leaders and even the Pope, mighty even as the current Pope might think he is, have no power or jurisdiction over civil governments. And also the church leaders, to church leaders, apply the words of 1 Peter 2, verse 13 and 14. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to the king as to one in authority, or to governors as sent by him. My brother and sister, I pray, and let us all pray, that God will grant you and me, now and in years to come, the wisdom, the discernment, the strength and courage to submit to our New Zealand government, from the prime minister down to the policeman who monitors the speed at which you and I are driving. Again, why should we submit to government in all things lawful? 1 Peter 2.13 gives the answer, for the Lord's sake, so that the holy name of God triune and the gospel will be upheld. And if God wills, that win even the unbelieving government official over for Christ. Amen. Let 